broadcasting from the far side of Enceladus, beaming in at the speed of light across the vast chasms of space, streaming directly into your brain. You're listening to the Spartacast League. I am Phelan, and joining us today are Attica and Gackle. So get ready, strap in, because tonight, as we broadcast, the U.S. has just wrapped up its first rounds of attacks in Syria as part of a unified push with the United Kingdom and France taking part in supposed attack against military targets. However, citizens on the ground have posted to Twitter showing that the missiles were hitting civilian targets in the suburbs. And as of right now, we are waiting for light to break in Syria to see what has been struck. Attica, your thoughts on this? I mean, the the typical leftist response of, oh, it's U.S. imperialism again. And it is U.S. imperialism again all sorts of conspiracy theories are going to abound that oh it's a false flag and oh assad didn't really do it which i mean i guess makes sense because what would he have to gain but syria is such a clusterfuck of a proxy war within a proxy war that i mean i mean who knows but we did the same thing in vietnam to justify a war we did the thing, same thing both times in the gulf and iraq to justify a war and there's really just there's no need to me the biggest impact is there isn't even anyone to root for it's not even a somewhat socialist state versus the united states it's just two new bullshit capitalist empires having a proxy war in this area i, I will say it that this happens has happened the exact same time last year and every time assad gets too close to winning all of a sudden there's a chemical attack and all of a sudden we strike Assad's airfields and set him back. Which I think only tells me so much that the U.S. has a vested interest in keeping this war going as long as possible. That no one's actually trying to win it. That it's just about prolonging the confusion and disorder in Syria as long as possible for profit and so that no side gets a permanent hold on it. Uh, Because I mean it has a really strategic position like like, you can basically attack anywhere in the Middle East through it. We don't have anything in Iraq anymore, supposedly. Afghanistan, though. But you can't get to the rest of the Middle East from Afghanistan. Like, Afghanistan is sandwiched between China and Iran. The only strategic position Afghanistan has is that it is next to Iran. Afghanistan is another thing, though, that shows, like, we've people have just accepted that we're staying in Afghanistan. Like, it's... People have kind of forgotten about it, but we've been there for over 18 years. There are major pipelines and lines of trade that go through Afghanistan. That was actually one of the very specific countries that were targeted in in Project for a New American Century, which was a Bush-based think tank that was around in the late 90s, early 2000s. They wrapped up in 2000, uh, and they actually wrote about how they needed to take control of Central Asia and that they needed a new Pearl Harbor event in order to to do it. And of course, you know, you get a year later, you have 9-11 occurring just on target. Everyone's going to scream at you, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, all oh, this stuff's bullshit. Even though, like, time and time again, it's proved not to be bullshit, but it's also been proven not. It's not necessarily a conspiracy per se, as it was just... I, I don't believe, for instance, there were bombs in the building, that kind of kind of stuff. I personally believe that maybe we had some foreknowledge and we just, through negligence, kind of let it happen. Plausible deniability kind of situation with that. Or maybe it was a mistake and they actually didn't legitly do anything with the intelligence because they, they couldn't piece it together. That could be a possibility, but I'd say simple answer that more than likely they probably just ignored the intelligence because it was beneficial and they probably didn't realize that that was going to happen. The thing that just proves most conspiracy theories to me is the United States can't get its shit together on a good day and somehow it's supposed to orchestrate major false flag uh, attacks. At best, it can like push and prod things in the right direction. And it's not like we didn't know or the United States didn't know that something was coming to its shores at some point, right? Like, you don't have to orchestrate the whole damn thing to know that Japan's going to attack you at some point because you have an island they want. In Syria, in this war, I think this is probably going to be a yearly thing. Like I said, this happens anytime Assad gets too winning and he mostly wins with his air force. And so we attack his air force and set him back a little bit so that we can prolong the war and continue to profit off of it. 
and continue to keep it a mess so no side gets a permanent foothold in the Middle East. Because if we can't have it, no one can have it. That's until one side decides to get impatient with the other, things escalate, spin out of control, and next thing you know, you are in a hot war. And that could happen. That's one of the things that we're afraid of happening with China is just things accidentally escalate because everybody thinks they're playing chicken up until the point they're not playing chicken. And then next thing you know, you have a hot war on your hands. And then everybody's wondering how we got there. Well, so you see, the, the thing about capitalism is that the bourgeoisie control it and the bourgeoisie are not going to destroy the world because then there's no more profit. If there is a hot war, it's not this be all end all end of the world war that everyone worries about because everyone makes the assumption stupidly that the countries are going to war for the benefit of anyone but the owners of their companies. And yeah, China has a bourgeoisie. The revolution failed and it, I wish it would just change the fucking flag and stop pretending so that we can all move on. The day you so change, like, they change the flag is the day you cry, though, because then you've realized that they're, they really are rolling it up. But at least then we can begin again, you know? At least then we don't have to ha continue to get hampered with the argument about when is China going to return to socialism. The kind of war that would happen from this would be like bullshit missiles fired at ships somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Like Russia's retaliation is not going to be this assault on the mainland United States. It's not even an assault anywhere in Europe, right? If they're really bold, they'll take out some positions that we have in Syria with U.S. troops. We're not going to escalate it into a war. The army considers those people expendable. And they don't want to let the world know, well, hey, by the way, we've had boots on the ground in Syria the whole damn time, right? So, because we do, because there's pictures, because, you know, I follow stuff that happens in Rojava. And we most certainly have a small army presence there, mostly of special forces, quote, teams that are able to do extremely targeted attacks and get extremely specific things done. But it's not like we have like a full deployed standing army there. So if we're just really bold, I think we'll attack one of those. But most likely, they're just going to probably wipe out some rebel group that we fund and call that the retaliation. Where do you because think this is going with Rojava in this whole situation? Does this change the equation with them? I think that the longer the war carries on, the better it is for Rojava, just strategically not making any value judgment. Just strategically, because that means they're left alone the most. Assad can't roll his tanks up there and put an end to the show. They have minor U.S. support, mostly because the U.S. doesn't want Turkey to get into its business. They lost Afrin, but it took them like a month to lose it. So Rojava's military is incredibly competent. I think that that taught Turkey that if it really wanted to take all of Rojava, it's looking at multiple years of engagement and occupation with an incredibly hostile native population. Afrin was kind of Rojava's farming territory, which is why, you know, the accusations of genocide fly because now like they're of course gonna not have as much food. Just thinking of the point of Rojava, like the longer that Russia and the US are busy within Syria, like the longer Rojava gets left alone, the more it can build its industry and the more industrialized it can become and then the more socialist-ish it can actually be. I've read some stories on Rojava of people in Rojava are selling real estate. <laughs> I mean, these are American sources, so I mean, it's not like they're gonna use socialist concepts, so like I take it with a grain of salt, but getting people to move out of Turkey down into Rojava. And of course, the Kurdish part of Iraq has a lot of autonomy and basically threatened revolution in Iraq if Iraq didn't kind of let them have their way. So they're trying to build, they're trying to build a corridor through Iraq to the Turkish part of Kurdistan so that there is actually a flow of troops and arms and there is actually somewhat of a de facto country. Uh, as far as they go, like the longer the war carries on in Syria, the less anybody has the time or resources to really pay attention to them. There's also another thing where the U.S. might be getting into a trade war with China now. The U.S. going to war with, uh, going to war in Syria and having a possible trade war is gonna 
The term, the term trade war doesn't mean an actual war. The term trade war means an escalation, a mutual tit-for-tat escalation of prices and tariffs, uh, yeah. restrictions, embargoes on certain products, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That could bring instability yeah. in certain circumstances. Well, it's, yeah, I mean, the whole world's on stability at this point. Anyone's still yeah. looking for stability. Look to Mao right now. What was it Mao says? It was like, everything under heaven is in chaos. The situation is perfect, or something like that. It's in these situations that socialists can actually win, because it's in these situations that people are willing to listen to things other than the official mainstream source that's presented to them, and believe in things outside of the dogma of the state that they live in. We also present a program that solves, at least theoretically, a lot of their problems. It's just our presence, it's our organization, it's our ground, it's that we don't have someone in the community like Phelan said, of you know, 25,000, every every community of at least 25,000 should have a socialist organization within it. It's the fact that we're not organized yet. But look what we've done over the course of the year, right? We're getting there. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Who's, is it going to be like an informal anarchist thing? Is it going to be the party of socialism and liberation? Is it going to be the Socialist Workers Party? I don't know. But we're getting there doesn't need to be any one group it we just need to make sure that if it is multiple groups we're working as a coalition we need a cultural shift that's more or less basically what we're getting at right yeah but, but it's it's everything starting to come down now in ways that it's not come down before just because everything in america is right now becoming apparent the institutions that people thought that they could trust before are all crumbling or people are just seeing it for what they are. For instance, like with the police shootings here, uh, we had three big examples here within the past two weeks since we've been off air. Uh, we had, of course, the guy that got you know shot in Sacramento, which happened just before we came on air. He was shot 20 times in his own backyard because he was holding a cell phone. Then you had the guy in Houston who was a mentally ill patient, uh, or person rather, I should say. He was mentally ill, he was walking down the street with his pants down, and the police shot him. And then there was the uh, another mentally ill guy in Brooklyn who was supposedly holding a pipe like a gun, and I saw the pictures of that. Yeah, admittedly, it did look like a gun, but it doesn't take nine bullets to disarm somebody to where they're no longer a threat. It's just a lack of caring on the part of the police and of actually doing their their duty and not realizing hey you know we did sign up for a dangerous job sometimes bad things are, are, are going to happen to you sometimes yeah you're gonna have to confront some guy with a gun or what you think could be a gun and it not be it's a weekly thing now if not daily that there's a pol police shooting like we were talking about a little bit before the show as things become more unsustainable the state is going to seek more and more force and more and more policing to justify and continue its existence which is going to exacerbate resistance to it which is the whole like fundamental conclusion of marx and lenin that that's just what it does so nothing that's happening right now within the confines of marxism is anything that isn't supposed to be happening right now Within Marxism, all of what's happening right now is accounted for. The only thing that isn't accounted for is why it's taken so long. Marx continually assumed, and like every socialist has always continually assumed, the revolution is right around the corner. Engels wrote about a certain a recession in England in the 80s that carried on longer than any of the others. We should clarify, that's the 1880s. Yeah, 1880s. Yeah, it's, it, it was called the Long Recession. Right. He assumed that the revolution was just right around the corner because the workers were getting fed up with it. And Marx and Engels did not live long enough to account for social democracy. Lenin was the one who accounted for social democracy and the state's newfound ability to give concessions to the working class to stave off actual revolution to make things seem not quite that bad. And the driving force for that throughout the 20th century was the Soviet Union's mere existence. Well, now that's gone. And so therefore all of the social democracy is gone 
and you're seeing most moderate people clamor for a return of social democracy, but there's no geopolitical engine for it. China, despite its red flag, doesn't even have universal health care. It doesn't have a network of social democracy. And for, for a bit of that, that's our fault because they can't, they, they don't have the ability to manufacture their own medications yet. So if they did a universal health care plan, they'd be buying it from American healthcare manufacturers, which like China's entire main thing in the revolution, even more bigger than socialism, the entire thing that justified, for the most part, the united front in the first place was China wanted to be unified and nationalized and self-sufficient and independent. And that was consistent throughout all of the factions from Mao to the Kuomintang to everyone who resisted Japanese uh, occupation. That's the um, one warning that I would give American socialists uh, as well is we really need to focus on self-sustaining systems. We need to make sure that if we do build up a movement that we're able to perform some level of self-sufficiency because if it's us versus them and we depend on them, then they can manipulate us in ways that would be strategically advantageous to them. That's sort of one of the unfortunate things about socialism is that in order for it to win, it does have to be very self-sufficient. And so it, it thinks inwardly within its own borders when it's supposed to be about erasing borders and thinking outwardly and connecting with other peoples. You know, there's no geopolitical engine for, to drive that social democracy. So I'll be surprised if it happens, because when do the people ever get what they want when they vote, right? Oh, everyone's saying they want social democracy. Well, without the fear of the Soviet Union, the state has no reason to give that concession unless we're organized. And that's another thing, like our organization could eventually, you know, be the reason for the social democracy that we don't want. We want the revolution. But unless there's a thing that scares the state so much for it to be willing to give that concession, it's not going to give that concession. Well, I mean, just look at like what is going on with like the police situation, like we we're talking earlier. So it's not just the shootings like there's a reason that people don't trust the police if it were just the shootings i don't think it would get as much traction as it is because also in the back of everybody's mind when they get pulled over like it's a scary situation it really is when you get pulled over because honestly you don't know what kind of mood that cop is in you don't know if that cop's gonna say uh can i see your wallet and while he's going through here why do you got so much money I'm going to have to take this money and we're going to have to get it drug tested. And of course, it's going to fail the drug test because there's particles of cocaine on every dollar bill because of the rollers that go through the ATMs collect cocaine from dollar bills. So anytime they do wait, that... Wait, 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 what? what? Wait, so people, people use... Do okay, so people use heads up, surpriser, dollar bills to snort cocaine. That's, that's a thing. Okay, but they're using cocaine on every single dollar bill. Yeah, okay, so let me explain how it gets there. So, <laughs> on the I'm rollers... Not you. I'm just like, this came out of nowhere. So, on the rollers of, of ATM, so, but basically what happens is, is the particulates get on the money. So, there's enough particulates on any given dollar bill that they can test and say, oh, it tests positive for traces. And that's all they need. And then they say, your money may have been witness to a crime, so we have to keep it. But the thing is, is then, of course, once it's in their custody, they're not necessarily responsible for it if they lose it, oddly enough. There's a lot of reasons why people don't trust the police. It's because they lie constantly. And it's just like I put an article in uh, about the uh, in the show notes about just how that's part of the culture of the police is to lie and distort in their favor. And in fact, it, the article uses the term test a lying, which is a term that they got from other cops when they uh, go into court. They... They test a lie. They stretch the truth a little bit while they're testifying. And uh, if uh, they get called on it, well, oh, I misspoke. When, when you grow up being told that the police is your friend and they're there to protect you and all they ever seem to do is shoot your 
your house and put your dad in jail. The, 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 this is how most people interact with the state is through the police. That's most people's contact with the state. And it's always a negative contact. Or the DMV, am I right? But speaking of, of police though, and like people that go to police, uh, you know who does trust the police? Christopher Cantwell. Cause it turns out he's been narking on his buds the entire time. And the alt-right is just having a hissy fit over this. <laughs> he's he's the one who, like, after Charlottesville did the whole crocodile tears of, like, you're being mean to us. And, like, there wasn't a single fucking tear on his face. That yeah, was. It, it wasn't even crocodile tears. It was just crocodile something. <laughs> it's just, it's no surprise, though, because really the alt-right doesn't have much of a sense of solidarity. So it's not surprised that they keep turning on each other, turning each other in. They keep going after each other. And we criticize each other on the left. Uh, we get upset with people on the left. But for the most part, we keep our disagreements with each other civil. That's the big difference there, is that the, the alt-right, at the end of the day, doesn't have the kind of solidarity. And I think this proves that we can defeat them through our ability to unify the way that we do and organize the way that we do. We build, liberals maintain status quo and the right just destroys everything, like itself, each other, their opponents, their, their allies. Like it's just, it manifested and run wild that everything that isn't them is dangerous in the enemy. And of course, the problem with that is like, how far do you divide the not us line? Like, where do you draw that? Because they don't understand how solidarity works or the fact that they do need to unify. As soon as a split emerges, it's pretty major for them. They continually blow out their own organization. And it's amazing how like thinking of it, it's amazing how they ever organized in the 1930s in the first place. Was the Nazi party the only fascist party in Germany or did they have a lot more to contend with? Uh, they kind of merged actually. Uh, so there was like the Frey Corps and all the other smaller institutions. They all just kind of like merged in slowly with the National Socialist Workers or whatever party, I forget the full acronym, that became the Nazi party. When they got in power, they started like splitting it off. The, they took out the SA, for instance, which was like their special police, but it was like a left wing version of the, the party and everything. That's where they basically would stick you if you had socialist ideas. And be like, yeah, join the SA. It's great. Uh, until they long knife you literally in the back in your bunker. And, and they kept doing this. Like they, uh, outlawed the, even they, they even outlawed the German myth, mythological religion that they were so big on pushing to keep Germany pure and everything in favor of like their version of Christianity, basically. Really? I didn't know that they got rid of the mysticism part of Nazism that like they literally had people crawling all over the mountains of Tibet looking for proof of. There were certain people in the inner party that were allowed to continue with the beliefs, but the outer party, like the, like the people uh, weren't allowed to participate in that. Huh. I thought that that was a constant justification that they continually used. By the end of the war, they had largely shedded that because part of that whole like attitude of mysticism, they, they did kind of realize though that that was like keeping them down from obtaining nuclear weapons because scientists in, in Nazi Germany had realized, yeah, maybe we were wrong about this whole magnetic electro universe thing. In a way, I guess it was kind of lucky that they were not pursuing that earlier, but it could have got a lot, lot differently had they abandoned it sooner uh, within the inner party. How was it preventing them from, from conducting science, the German mythology and stuff? They felt that it interfered with the whole, their whole like mystical view, which is kind of weird because like nowadays, like you hear people like mysticists talk about like quantum man, that's my justification for magic. You know, back then it wasn't so much. So they saw it as, as a threat, the whole like quantum nuclear kind of thing. That was Jew science to them. 
I think Einstein himself said that like if his theory of relativity was correct, Germany would call him a German. And if it was incorrect, they'd call him a Jew or something like that. But yeah, it's a continual quest for purity that whittles itself down to uh, the only person who's pure is is me. And I run the party. So in the end, you know, the person running the show is the only one who's pure and everyone else just gets axed. So like it, it's it's just entirely self-destructive. So it's not surprising to see them break up. It's a little surprising to see them break up this early. And I think that's because the resistance to them has been so effective. It's inevitable. I mean, it, it's also simultaneous with the breakup of the Republican Party, which liberals claim is going on to a much bigger extent than it really is. Like it's sort of like it's sort of Schrodinger's GOP, right? Like at the same time as they're like hemorrhaging people as they take the money and run and they're starting to fight each other and quit and, and leave office and resign. They're also like stacking court and passing all their tax cuts and doing all the stuff that they said they always wanted to do. I guess this parallel is that that is sort of like with the alt-right, you know, they they controlled for a little while the narrative uh, uh, on the internet among, you know, you know, publicly among subcultures until they were kicked out in under a year and started to split up. Have you ever heard of the term, and I know you have, uh, like the throes of death? Yeah, like <clears throat> when you're writhing and, and like dying. I want to be careful because, you know, that prediction is always made about everything. Like there are liberals who every day wake up and, you know, say, oh, you Bernie Sanders, he's in his death throes, you know, no one's going to be listening to him by the end of the day. Yeah, the idea, though, the death rose is is that a lot of times what what you'll see here is, you know, when a movement is dying they go for broke because they don't have much of an option. So I think that that's actually what we're seeing with the alt-right. And that doesn't mean that we can be complacent about it. That actually means that we do need to be more vigilant about it because an organization in its throes, that could also be birth pangs as well. So like this is kind of like this whole metaphysical idea, right? So it could be their throes of death or it could be a rebirth, but we're the ones to determine that by how we handle the situation if we yeah. push back and and continue to fight them and they go away yeah it's it's their throes of death but if we s let them continue doing what they're doing and they grow it, it, the situation does get dangerous and it could become a rebirth so anytime you do see the throes of death you should always be vigilant because it could just as easily be pangs of rebirth but then I also want to bring up their own statements of, of planning, you know, on their secret treehouse that I swear they don't realize anyone can just go to 4chan and read. Their new strategy is incredibly self-defeating. Their strategy is now a strategy of disengagement. Their proposed action from the anonymous 4chan Nazis, I don't know how they like come to agreements on this stuff. I don't know what makes this stuff official, how things get adopted as the plan of action. But assuming that this is it, quoting reading here, whenever you see an article or tweet or post on normie media that makes you want to spurg out, but you can't act for fear of revealing your power level, why, the, why do they talk like, <laughs> like they're in an RPG? <laughs> Fucking gamer, they swear. Simply reply with the following statement. Thanks for pushing normal people even further to the right. You know, there's that, that constant need to justify how normal they are. I'm so normal. I, I promise you I'm normal. As they try to start an argument, simply keep repeating. As I said, thanks for pushing normal people further to the right to whatever arguments they make whenever you see the comment upvote and like it so so they're now they're always always be suspicious when somebody claims that they're normal because that means that they're not <laughs> yeah, nobody really, like, nobody should ever have to tell you no i'm normal what why do you have a problem with me i'm only holding a knife I'm a normal family man run for Congress in the Republican Party. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know who else was normal and a kind guy and all his neighbors loved him 
was the BTK killer. So their strategy here is of disengagement. They're no longer pushing their point. They're just taking their toys and going home. Thanks for pushing normal people even further to the right. No pushback, no no swaz to meme. This is this is a retreat. And this is this is their new strategy. So so they are very, very much going back to base to the drawing board without wanting to admit that they're losing ground. Um, and, and this also just makes know. it really easy to kind of figure out who's saying this kind of stuff. Because really all you gotta do, let's say you come across one of these people that that is doing this, right? So you click on their little avatar or their username. And you can go through their posts, right? So you're going to immediately see like, oh, this is strange behavior. Let's see what this guy's about. And then of course, eventually you're gonna get to the Kekistan flags and the swastikas and the Pepe's and, and all the weird stuff. And anybody normal, once they see that, they're gonna be like, whoa. Right, but mo so, so their entire thing, like the way that they break up they hope the that, world. They hope that is, everybody's is dumb enough into, not to research them. They, okay, for the most part, they are, but they assume that much more of the like. They, that's why they break their world up to them, the very normal people who are downtrodden, but because they're white, deserve to run everything. The normies who God have wives term. and girlfriends. <laughs> that they think they should have their girlfriend who they look down upon because they just don't get their obsession with games or whatever. And then there's the leftists who are constantly trying to take everything away from them. And so that's how they break up their world. And they're constantly pitching, constantly trying to normalize themselves by playing to quote normies ignorance. And yeah, there are going to be those who go and click and research and people are becoming more and more aware of these tactics. But for the most part, from my own experience in like telegram chat rooms and furries specifically, like furries are incredibly conflict averse. We will justify everything from like stolen art to like outright rape is quote furry drama. So like posting that doesn't really necessarily work because their, their whole thing that they bank on is that anyone who counters their argument, they have a script that they go by to make that person look like they're the problem for having a problem with it. You having a problem with their swastika and their trolling, you're the source of the angst and you're the source of social destabilization. And if you just shut up, you know, everything will be fine. Come on, we need to get this person to shut up, gavel around all the quote normies to, you know, get, get the annoying SJW to stop talking. So the best thing to do is to know their script and not play into it because they don't know what to do and you don't follow their script. They'll continue like miss your beats on the script they've written for you and they'll just keep going through their side and then they look weird. They're the ones who seem really out of place. They don't know what to do with that. And like every time I've tried that, it's worked because they don't have a counter for it. They don't know what to do. And I'm not saying ignore them. I'm not saying don't feed the trolls. And I'm not saying, oh, ignore it, it'll go away because it doesn't work either. Not, quote, reacting like an SJW. Their scripts are written for an SJW and what SJWs do. And if you just say stuff like, why are you, this is weird. Well, they'll continue to run through their script and then they look really awkward because it's like they're having a conversation with themselves or like are having an entirely different conversation than what's actually happening. And that's what I found to be the most effective way is to know their script and then purposefully like screw up your lines because they don't know what to do. It's funny when they keep going with the script even after you've derailed it. Just posting that picture as a response is not going to be as effective as just derailing their script. But it is something people need to be aware of so that they can combat it as well. And I think it is a very easy thing to combat. There's different ways that you can do it. Of course, you could just post the script. That's the most obvious way, but they'll, of course, try to attack it. Even though that's like the weakest defense, it still is effective because people see, oh, wait, yeah, you are kind of doing that, aren't you? But of course, like you could do like what, you know, your proposal is a little bit stronger is just why are you being weird or derail the conversation with them where they keep sticking to their points because they don't know how to respond. I've noticed that as well, especially on Twitter. They seem to all, all the trolls seem to have various canned responses. And then when they can't respond back uh, because you've thrown them off for a loop, 
Uh, my favorite one is like they try to get me on gun control because I'm reasonably for gun control, but I, I'm very much pro gun and people should have guns as long as they're qualified to handle them. So like that part, so, like, like because it, it throws them off like, like I have a gun and I know how to shoot it, right? All of a sudden they're like, oh, no, you don't because you're a liberal. And I'm like, no, I do. And you're totally wrong. <laughs> don't call me a fucking liberal. Yeah, and now we have to talk about, about gun control, right? And and I, I participated in those marches. I think we may have talked about this on another yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, we did. We, we don't have yeah. to talk about that gun control. We already got it covered, bro. We do have to talk about the just born court case, though, with the peeps. Of course, you guys know I love my peeps. I'm talking about little marshmallow things. It's nothing more I love at Easter time than to sit down, eat a whole box, take about three shots of whiskey, and throw everything up in the toilet in about two hours. When peeps are up to evil bourgeoisie peep bullshit, there's no, there's nothing good in the world. Something else that made me sick to my stomach with peeps besides actually eating them was the fact that they're in a lawsuit right now because they want to get out of their pension program without paying the, the government the $60 million fine to basically conserve existing pensioners' retirement so that the people that are already getting pensions or that are will in the future are supposed to that have already paid into that program will get those pensions and get their money back that they paid in. They're literally trying to opt out of that. And this sets off, because it's a court case, it'll set precedent to where other companies can do this. So just literally just breaks the entire American retirement system, uh, especially for people that do have pensions, which of course isn't a lot anymore, but... This is the deconstruction of the 20th century social democracy that was built in this country. And at the bare minimum, to let Dave off the revolution and fear of the Soviet Union. And I'm kind of surprised it took this long. Like having now a leftist understanding of geopolitics, it's kind of surprising that all of this just wasn't done in the 90s. In 1989, the wall comes down. Okay, that's it for the Soviet Union. Let's cut social security now. Okay, the Soviet Union's gone. Let's just like ramp it up and start getting rid of everything. I'm really surprised it took this long to deconstruct and to just totally destroy all of the New Deal programs that were put in place. But yeah, like it's just another episode of the bourgeoisie being able to do whatever they want because they have a government that has basically sent the message, do whatever you want. Well, this isn't um, even like the disassembling of the welfare state. Pensions aren't welfare. This is a system that you pay into. It's deferred wages. And the only reason that they would have to pay a fine is because people are no longer paying into that. So they have to guarantee the people that are already receiving pensions or that have paid in already will get that money right so it's not a part okay so it's not you're right it's not a part of the welfare state but it's still a it's still a setup of social welfare it's still the idea of caring for you after retirement and the very concept of retirement the, the very concept of an age at which you stop working and don't just drop dead because you're no longer able to generate money for your employer that didn't exist until like the very, 30s yeah it's of a very new concept it's still in that realm of le dampening the impact of capitalism like it's still in that in that area so no it's not a government program it's not because it's not a public pension you're right it's still in that train of thought that fight is also being carried out around the world right now. In France, for instance, they're striking over similar stuff here. Rail workers, teachers, 200,000 other workers were out striking against the neoliberal policies of President uh, Macron because of economic overhauls. A lot of my neoliberal friends will say stuff like, oh, when isn't France striking? And France always has a protest and like, but like this is off the charts as far like this hasn't happened since like 1968 and that almost was a revolution another one i i remember the riots in france in in the 2000s actually and they were nothing like this the riots in france in the 2000s which is what every a liberal likes to compare it to oh yeah they, that, that's what they're referring to there are riots in france in the 2000s at most i think the largest riot had maybe 2,000 people 
and it was very small. This is, we're talking nationwide strikes where 200,000 other sector workers, so I'm assuming private or maybe government sector workers, in addition to teachers and rail workers. It's not quite a general strike, but it's very close. And then there's stuff like the ZAD, which I didn't even know was a thing. And apparently there's more than one of them in France. French anarchists have been very, very competent in building small autonomous areas that exist outside of the state and capitalism. Oh my the, God, let's talk about the ZAD. Uh, fuck French. Uh, zone au de défense, I guess. Zone to defend, which was derivative of its original name, which was also in French. It started as a as an occupation protest of land that an airport was going to be built on that was going to be incredibly destructive to the environment. And it just continued to grow and then settled permanently. And people built houses and farms, an entire socialized village that's miles wide where people just ended up living. You know, there's no rent, there's no employment, there's no wages. The work that's done is socially necessary. They're not all dying and starving. And there was an attempt to evict them in 2010 that failed. And there was an attempt to evict them last week that also failed. Like we're talking like the, the, the couple of, we're talking like a couple thousand people, like a really small, small town, miles wide. And the media really downplayed it as well. The only res resources I could really find in English, they called them eco warriors. They said there were about 250 present at, at basically the riot is, is what they insinuated, but it was more of a battle actually, because there were tanks there. Yeah, I mean, it was 24,000 police. I'm sorry, not 24,000, 2,400 uh, 2, police and some tanks. Not like, you know, army tanks, police tanks, like the six-wheeled anti-riot armored cars. l you know, Yeah, with turrets on them. To evict what was at that time a couple hundred people who had stayed. And they lost ground for a few days, but it took days for the police to take that ground and you know i saw a picture of a pile of hundreds and hundreds of tear gas canisters and the police gave up and they rolled home and you know so france has been very very effective in building this because this isn't the only one the only area like this like there are a couple not exactly in the same way france this year has really turned up the heat on any kind of like leftist autonomous sort of mini secession area where people just go and do their own thing and, and it's like it's all in french news and i can't read it so i don't know as much as i'd like to know about it but like the defense of the zad and simultaneously i'm gonna bang on the left here a little bit the lack of knowing what it was and yes i know i just said i didn't even know what it was but like i got in on it and i learned what it was and i followed it and i knew what was going on i found videos about it you know sort of the lack of even just interest in it on the left among like chat rooms which is probably a bad barometer it was kind of disappointing if if we're going to be socialists we should attempt to live socialism and that means we should know about the struggles going on in other countries as best we can which is complicated by the fact that most of the time it's not reported in mainstream media it's reported in local and independent media in languages that we can't read so i get it there should be an effort made this really goes to show what the left is capable of if they applied themselves because this was a defeat at the hands of the french government by anarchists yeah and like 250 anarchists and they didn't even have to use guns like as it was going down i was like god they have to shoot back they have to shoot back you know like this isn't like a protest right like these are their farms and they've lived here for a decade a decade this thing existed and these are their homes and their homes are being rolled over by tanks like what would you do if you were a farmer and trump started rolling tanks over your farmland like yeah at that point shoot them like i'm gonna get called an evil violent leftist but this isn't a protest where like you're just shooting at please like they're rolling tanks over the farm and the house you built and have lived in for 10 years and they didn't even have to do that to win they just literally had to outlast the tear gas and make every inch of ground as frustrating for the police to take by building flaming tire barricades and spikes in the road and i think what probably happened was the operation too expensive to continue Right. So the um, message to the left is we need to quit packing up and going home in America and we need to start fighting back, pushing back, making well, okay. it hard for. OK, hold on, because 
I'm going to explain my own experience in the protests, which is not the left's fault. In America, the thing about this ad, it was like all anarchists or like left-leaning people. Sure, there were some university people there who were using the land for, you know, university projects who weren't necessarily anarchists. But like everyone was unified on that front. In America, at a protest, in my experience, what happens repeatedly is massive amounts of people, hundreds to like thousands of people will come out to protest. The police will show up and 90% of those people who are liberals will go home. And that leaves a handful of black bloc anarchists and communists to have really no other option than to retreat because the entire force that could have held the ground just ran away and went home. And now you're left with a handful of, of your friends and your people to hold territory for a protest that for the most part isn't even there anymore. So it's because in the protests that I was at, the anarchists did not run away. Even when all the liberals ran away, the anarchists did not run away from the tear gas. And the communists were around picking up people that tripped and fell and were like having asthma attacks. But we're, we had no option but to retreat. Like there was no holding that ground. We just had to pick up people as best we could and continue to fall back. So it's not that the left runs away, it's that the liberals run away. And then we're left going, well, fuck, what do we do now? We got the Occupy movement where they didn't occupy anything. True. Okay. So, like, they missed the mark with the parks. They needed to have occupied government buildings. <laughs> That's what I have to say about that. Well, I mean, even, even if they made, even if the left attempted to make places like the zones of defense in France, if we would be able to do that on undeveloped land or like land where there's suburbs, but there's empty houses. So we go in and occupy them and say, you know what? F you. It's, it's ours now because you're not letting people live in there. You're wanting to charge people millions of dollars to live in these houses and nobody's living in them. If we started doing stuff like that and then made it expensive for the police to take action, let's say like we did this and then, okay, the police show up and let's say like even if we did lose we could make it so destructive for them that losing would be a pyrrhic victory for them. We could literally just burn the entire thing to the ground as we're leaving if, if, we, if it were necessary to do so, just so they couldn't profit off of it. That's how Russia beat Napoleon. They just retreated and burned everything that made it useless. It's protected people war, actually. So let's say if you did this, but if you did it in the countryside where they have to extend the supply line out and then you attack the supply line that's called protected people's people's war that's a, a maoist tactic actually there's a term for that kind of victory i don't know how to, it starts with a p fire fire uh, uh, pyrrhic. Pyrrhic. Uh, so so pyrrhic. yeah so uh, a pyrrhic victory is where you have won but you have also lost so that's not the point of people's war that's not really to do that uh, in a people's war though it does make the victories pyrrhic for the imperialists because they're, they're so costly to do because you're attacking their supply lines and eventually they may get to a point where they can't even win anymore or if they do win it's like well what have we conquered we've conquered ash and for imperialists they have a constant amount of people at home that they have to keep duped and dope and then provide a justification for taking their sons and daughters off farms and sending them to die right in the most common justification is nationalism but when you've conquered ash well, there's no justification our great nation that now controls this other nation of useless land well i mean people are <laughs> upset people. when they found out what we were doing in afghanistan with the poppies and stuff like that because their sons and daughters would come home and they would shoot up with heroin uh, or they saw it in their streets with their neighbors and everybody's a junkie and they're wondering where all the heroin's coming from. Well, it's not really coming from like, Afghanistan because ours is synthetically made, but we're flooding it into to Russia doing the same thing to the Russians with Afghanistan. People are rightly upset when they see that we're over there defending that and their people their neighbors, sons, daughters coming home or whatever are, are dying from this drug that even though it's not maybe the same supply line, but it's the same thing that they're they're dying for in their communities. It makes battles incredibly hard to justify. 
one of like the easy, one of the most common things used to turn public opinion against the protest is, oh, they're breaking windows and attacking Starbucks or whatever. Well, okay, if you're burning down your own tents and stuff, then like, who's like, it's not as easy to turn that into turn public opinion right. against the protest. I think the the end takeaway with the zone of defense is that it shows that the left can win against the police and against the state. We just have to actually try. And if we try, then we will. But if we don't try, if we keep retreating, then nothing's ever going to happen. Nothing's going to get done. And we're just going to be bogged down in this negative attitude. It comes down to whether the liberals run away or not. It It comes down to either if you build enough leftists that if the liberals went away it doesn't matter like you can still hold the ground or like the liberals have to be convinced to stay they can go to the back you don't have to use them as meat shows like yeah you can go to the back of the protest but like we need your numbers actually the back is probably best because they will be the first ones to run away and if they're in the front communists and anarchists are in the back the communists and anarchists aren't going to run away run away and they'll get bottlenecked and then all you're going to have to do have is like massacred liberals who are like all coughing from tear gas if they so don't like, if they don't want to do that I, i'm fine with them like just being there being there showing the numbers but you know it would be nice to see them fight for once for what they supposedly believe in and fight for their own self-interest but you're right god if they're not cowards i mean i tell you if we're able to maybe just get a little bit more pull get people convinced and and sold on the ideas that's why i'm such a big advocate for uh things like yeah maybe we should have like something akin to the austin red guard that in every you know city with more than twenty five thousand people in it and those people need to get their uniforms they need to go out there and They don't need to fight police. That should not be the first thing you're doing because that's going to make you look really bad and that's going to make people sympathize with the police. Instead, what you're going to want to do is you want to do what you said uh, in a former episode. Go in your kitchen, get some food, put it in a pot, cook it up, and go to people's houses that you know that need food or go out to a park and distribute food to people that are in need because that's going to have more of an effect than anything else and it's damn sure gonna have more of an effect than just sitting around arguing on the internet of what to do and if you do it in a visible uniform where people know oh yeah that's that's red guard they come out here every week and distribute food who are they the people going to side with in in a dispute are they going to side with the police or are they going to side with the people that help them out every so often the person that helped put your you know the tire on your car you know when you were broke down on the street you know struggling to get a tire on i'm gonna split the party we just lost all the anarchists in the room (laughs) when you said uniforms Um, anarchists have uniforms what are you talking about they can dress in black i don't i don't care what you're wearing just as long as it's (laughs) just as long as it's something identifiable that you could say yeah hey i'm with so and so and you know this is what we do i think it'd be just as good to say you know i'm a leftist or i'm a socialist because especially if there isn't one big cpusa right like it's small little groups so it's not confusing probably be best to just say i'm socialist you'd probably be best to just say i'm a socialist because then it's getting the idea across and it's not this group and that group and trying to remember you know an alphabet soup of it all so there's actually something problematic with austin redguard and the and this goes to like our own version of splitting and this is something my friend coro told me when i brought up like hey you're in texas right why don't you like drive out to go hang out with austin redguard she told me like oh you know they're like transphobic and they like yell at trans women because they think that they're bourgeoisie for spending money on getting oh, transition uh, just I, why do they why 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 do leftist groups have to do this it really is such a small fucking useless point if you don't if you don't tra- want to have a sex like change a don't a have a sex change it's not that hard no it's it, it well okay yeah sorry I, I see where you're coming from trans people are like a percent of a percent of the population and to pit your entire political ideologies fate on how you treat 
that one section of the population. It's just, it's tactically dumb. Even if you have a problem with it, even if your Maoist rule book tells you that, you know, this non-conformity is bad or whatever, like for the success of I'm a Maoist and I find this attitude disgusting within Maoist circles. And it's mostly, there's nothing within Maoism that exactly says trans people are bad. There just isn't. Maoists need to get over themselves. And I think the only reason they do it is because the freaking top two Maoists on the internet right now are freaking transphobic as heck. And you know who I'm talking about, and I don't have to mention their names, but they're getting called out. Wait. uh, Don't say no. Don't say it. Jason the Hedgehog? Yeah, the Hedgehog. The Hedgehog. (laughs) Jason the Hedgehog. I'll, I'll, I'll take Jimmy Dora over him any day, even though Jimmy Dora, I think, is incredibly annoying. I want to see Jimmy Dora and Jason the Hedgehog <laughs> on the same show. <laughs> One other thing like I do want to get into, because Zod was a victory, but today, this week was a great week for victory w- with the left. And I think we should celebrate. We should have a beer. Uh, teachers... Arizona was it was a Pyrrhic victory because they took the money from uh, the police budget. So, well, no, okay, that was a okay. So, just some background. That was a proposal. So, basically, what's going on in Arizona, as far as the teachers possible teacher strike, is it's a waiting game because right now the Arizona budget is on the floor of the state house and senate being debated, uh, and everyone's trying to get their edge in. So. The teachers are waiting to see if they can get their victory, if they can get their raise without having to strike it by getting it into the budget by pulling all those political levers. And if they do, then there's no reason to strike. So in other um, words, you're saying that they made... So one of the proposals that was made by the Republicans was that, okay, you'll get your 20% raise and all this other stuff, but it's coming out of the veteran support budget and police pensions. Which, yeah, yeah, which was so that was all, a douche move. Take it all out of the police, but like the point, the point of it is, is you know, rev up the class war, right? Because then veterans are going to hate the teachers, and the police are going to have a reason to pull over anyone with the teachers' strike bumper stickers and stuff on their cars. So it's it's to be able to frame it as the police teachers are anti-police and don't care about your kids, and if your kids are safe or whatever. So, I mean, it was it, it was a proposal, and it's probably not going to go anywhere, but it, it was definitely a threat because we found out about it because it was broadcast on the local news. So, like, they got it out there onto the local news to get it into the... So, so here's the thing. If, if you are a police, and let's say you're listening, and I know this show's probably not your bag, and you probably don't agree with me, probably think you're... You probably think that I'm a scumbag. But if there's any takeaway from this, if you're a police, if you're a veteran, don't be mad at teachers because they're not the ones that propose this. They didn't say... We want to take this out of police pensions. We want we want to take this out of veterans' pensions or whatever. They didn't say that, right? This was the government proposing this in a budget. If only, like, if only it was as easy as giving a cop a Pepsi and sitting down and explaining to them their role in the class war. And then they go, oh, okay, I didn't realize I was the bad guy. <laughs> you know, they're not going to have an are we the baddies moment. <laughs> they would have had it by now. It's, you know, one more trick. I was talking, so I, I went to the first Democratic Party precinct local meeting thing in forever, uh, like a year. So I wanted to see how much has changed. <laughs> and the party organizer had a sticker on the back of his clipboard that said no war but class war so i don't know who's co-opting who there you know i was talking to one of the people there who i think if i remember correctly she was a social worker who worked in one of the local elementary schools and he was talking about oh, you know the kids they're not racist and they're not full of hate and they they all care about each other and so like i was trying to explain to her not using like any official terms or whatever like class divisions in society i said well you know when when you're a kid in elementary school you're more united against the teacher and you know the lunchroom monitor right then you you have no reason to have a division between each other 
But then you get out and you get into the world and you get put on the track for either college or a job or prison. So suddenly some classmates, you go to college and some go to prison and some work a McJob and then you're all sorted out into your different roles and pitted against each other by the government and made to fight. And that's where the origin for social strife comes from. And that's how people pick up trying to understand why they're constantly in conflict with each other, pick up theories like bullshit, racism, and hating the poor, and that kind of thing. And she was like, she sort of nodded, like she was kind of getting it, but I, I don't I don't know if the, the, the folk ever like fully get it. Um, I feel like my local Democratic Party has completed the transformation into a social Democrat Party. Uh, it feels that way. There is definitely a leftist bench that sits in it and pushes it in that direction. And the language very much seemed very social democrat. I guess what Lenin would call a Kautskyite. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> it's that funny? <laughs> the, the Kauts the, that's what they are, they're Kautskyites. Though not even, right? Because Kautsky would misinterpret Marx, try to say how the states, oh, we just have to get voted into power and then we'll control the state. He left out all the Entryism. good bits. You know, and Lenin just tears that apart in State and Revolution and tells them all they're idiots. Getting back to the teacher thing, though, with the Arizona thing, because it sounds like what, what you were saying earlier, though, that they're going to reconfigure the budget so maybe the police officers and the veterans don't won't lose out. So there's not going to be this division here. And I'm hoping that that's going to be the case. Because oh, that's that, that's gonna like that has no chance of happening. That was that was just a bullshit scare tactic that the GOP pulled to get it on the news to try to turn public opinion against teachers. You know, so so people will wish you watch go. Well, I support the teachers, but we can't take all the money from the police because we need the police. What do we do? I don't see that tactic really working though. Like that's gonna backfire. No, it, it's not. It's definitely a tactic of desperation. Like the GOP has put themselves into the position of to accomplish what they want to do. They literally have to just brute force. They just have to keep beating with the stick. The state has no more carrot. That's what's different between now and the 60s. In the 60s, the state had a carrot. It had Medicaid. It had Medicare. It had civil rights. It had something that it could give. It had social democracy. It had a, it, it, it had a carrot that it could give instead of the stick and then society took the carrot uh and now today there's just no carrot it's just stick and stick and stick and that's always 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 long term a losing a losing strategy so i mean their only option is to just brute force deny everything the teachers want or to just pitter patter and hope the teachers just waste their time and, and tire themselves out there was a really important mining strike in 1938, I think, in Arizona, and it failed miserably. It carried on for like three years. All of the striking miners pretty much got replaced by scabs. It accomplished nothing. And that's been Arizona's go-to strategy forever, is to try to repeat that, try to prolong the strike to unreasonable lengths so that it seems the new normal, and then just hire a bunch of scabs. I mean, Arizona's been trying to transfer most public school funds into charter schools anyway, so that it can just have a bunch of private schools and not have to deal with public education at all. And just let these charter schools be free-for-alls. You know, charter schools in black neighborhoods are just gonna be shit. Like, the 60s South level of nothing. And then, you know, all the nice charter schools in Scottsdale are just going to have every option available. It'll basically um, be the Florida education system. Oh, is that what it was like even with you growing up? No, like, no, charter? that's that's what they... Okay, so when I grew up, I actually went to a public school. It wasn't a charter school. They started adopting school choice when... I was in high school, I think, and I will tell you that a lot of school districts started getting really bad around that time. There was a definite noticeable difference in the districts that allowed charter schools to basically dominate the, the arena. And that's what, you know, Arizona wants to do, but like with complete dismantlement 
of the public school system. So this is really, in effect, fighting for the life of the public school system. That school, the school that the Democratic Party meeting was held in, by the way, like it totally felt like a prison, <laughs> like prison lunch line, clock on the wall, like drab gray walls. <laughs> like folk cult is entirely right. Aren't schools supposed to be these like bright, cheerful places that help? Yeah, it was them? not. Oh my gosh, it, it. Why am I just not surprised? Society is multiple levels of prison. There's no freedom. It's just different you have extremities to be told of that you're free. Out. School, it, it feels like a prison. And then you get out, and it's like the, the most free you're able to be is in your house. But even then, if you're renting, you're just paying for this cell that they can get you out at any time. And it works like the next step down because you can't leave when you want to leave and you can't do what you want to do. And then if, you know, you, f you, you press too hard against that, then you go to a real prison where just everything is controlled. So, so the teachers are, are really kind of in a fight for public education in its entirety. And I'm not really sure about their strategy with the state budget. Like I understand not striking because then you have the threat of striking to hold over the state as they put together their budget, knowing that if they don't give you what you want, you're going to strike, and then they have a problem. It's obvious the GOP does not want to give them what they want, though. But they um, need to write the budget, they need to let them write the budget, let government do its thing, and then once government fails them, that's, that's when they need to do the strike. Because if they do it prematurely, it's going to look bad. The yeah. other thing is that on top of that, they need to make sure that, like, for instance, with Oklahoma, they won their demands. But the only reason they the only reason that they striked in Oklahoma the way they did was is because Oklahoma hasn't raised their taxes in like Oklahoma or, or West Virginia. Uh to the extent both, the problems were very similar. Oklahoma hasn't really raised their taxes since the 90s. And so they were working with the same type of budget, but inflation. So they were getting the same kind of revenue that, and that they were getting in the 90s or less. And they were trying to distribute that among more people in the schools. So that's why they striked is because they didn't have any any other outlet to do so. So they had already exhausted all of their options. And right now, Arizona's in the process of writing their budget. They have the opportunity right now to correct the issue. So the best option is let them correct the issue. And if they fail at that point, that's when they need to go in and, and strike at that point. But doing so beforehand only puts them on the defensive the only thing about that is that it's really you know now now they're in a game of bargaining where they're going they, they could possibly be subjected to bargaining away parts of their demands for concessions that might not even make it into the final budget so you know they could be talked down from a 20 percent raise so uh, if you accept a five percent raise we'll give you that but you know we're not going to give the you know the increased budget for i i don't know exactly i don't know what their full demands are but i know it's it's along with the teacher's raise it's fully funded student programs like after school programs they, they could be forced to negotiate away their demands you know, if you accept five percent raise then we'll fully fund the after school care program that kind of thing and it, it is a wildcat strike like there is no teachers union in arizona um i mean that's both both good and bad because there's no union representative to screw up the negotiation but there's also that makes it easier to buy out important people in the movement, which I'm sure is something that's already been attempted. So it just, it opens it up to them bargaining away and accepting lower concessions. God, if Democrats don't just love to do that, it seems. <laughs> to go in Democrats with, with are the great party demands of... and walk out with nothing and say we won. Democrats are the party of low standards. 
before we get on to our next story though, uh, we do got to do an ad read here. We actually have a sponsor here for the network now. So. We have a sponsor? Yeah, we, what? we do. So well, What kind of fucking capitalists are we? I, hey, they said they'd give me money to do the ad read, so we're doing the ad read here. And I, I wrote this- Who is this? What? I, I wrote this especially for them. They, they came, they said, look, we want you to sell your product on your show. I was like, yeah, I'll take your money. You work hard for your money, day in and day out. Holland steel 48 hours for the boss man. So when you are running over protesters in your truck to please Porky's desire for ever expanding profits, make sure you do it in a Ford truck. Ford, because God knows you can't spell Chevrolet. So our next story in line here, speaking of just like state incompetence here, is Michigan. <laughs> How was that, you guys? You guys like if if you guys want us to do more of that, let us know in the comments, and we we will. Uh, but Michigan, Flint, Michigan, is no longer going to be providing free bottled water. Uh, to the citizens of Flint because they have fixed the problem. That's right. 50% of the city's water pipes are now considered safe. Who was... Okay, what company was providing the water? You're going to love this. Nestle. Oh, yeah, I've heard about... Okay, so this is a part of the reason why everyone's angry at Nestle. Yeah, so Nestle owns a facility that is i think that they're taking water either from the lake or from the ground nearby and they're basically bottling it up and selling it like they do with all their their other bottled water so that's why these people are upset because these people had to drink out of the nasty flint river while nestle got to tap in to the source that they were previously tapping from do the bourgeoisie just assume that they can just shoot everyone when it comes down to it? They can just murder, you know, like anyone who has a problem with their shit. To fly so flagrantly in the f face of everyone, do they just assume that when the time comes, they'll just be able to mow everyone down with no opposition? Do they I not would, concede I that they themselves put their lives on the line? That I, Honestly, I, th I kind of at this point think that they think they're immortal. I mean, because they, they act like they don't have a sense, sense of um, mortality. Like, they literally just act as gods. Because truth be told, the CEO of Nestle <clears throat> can stay in his fortress, and it'll be the underlings who get killed when the people rise up and storm the water facility. Right, and he's, he's also the guy that said that people aren't entitled to fresh water. Like, he literally said that. He, he doesn't care if he owns all of the world's water supply and everybody has to pay him absorbent amounts to get water. He would love that. He, he would love it more than anything. The, I mean, that's their whole aim, their whole goal. And they, they must just assume that they have the guns to back it up. Or, you know, they must just assume they either have the guns to back it up or the news facility to keep everyone dumb and convince that it's the best thing for them and that there's no other way. But it, it just... Yeah, with how amazingly easy it's been to form physical street opposition, let alone like which what I've seen in a year of just, you know, pushing local democratic parties towards social democracy at the very least. If everybody uh, pushed as hard as Zod did before, then they would have a serious problem because the police basically retreated. They refused. Right, but like the fundamental difference with the Zod and every other protest is that the protests are convened by people who show up at a certain time. There, there's no... Uh, That's a liberal American protest, yes. But no, specifically, so the Zod was tied to the land. They, they've lived there for 10 years. They've farmed there, they've had animals. It has become their home, a part of their nature and their being, and they're defending their home just as one would take a gun and defend their farm that you know they owned by law or or not or it's the government rolling tanks over your home versus a protest where you're convening at a certain point 
you, you don't know the full area, you know, you don't have a place to retreat to. It's not your home. You're not emotionally, physically invested in defending it. Like you'd see people fight just that hard if the government decided to roll tanks over Flint, Michigan. Like you'd see people fight just as hard. But when they're convening a protest to, over a specific issue in a public area, there is not that same drive to stand and fight. And you know it's what? a fundamentally there, different there, there, way of organizing. There was recently one time where something like that did happen. The No Dapple protest. <laughs> Right. And again, that was people's home that they had lived on for even longer, for generations, for hundreds of years. It, it was, but most of the protesters were from elsewhere and they stood by those people. And I thought that was that was very impressive. And if we could see more like that, if we could see more, well, I think we're going to more people. And I, I hope we do. I hope that people get the backbone to stand up against this. And the final few items here that I did want to cover, uh, we did have some uh, really interesting stories in the media. Uh, we all love the news media. It's our best friend in this country, wouldn't you say, Attica? It is the drug that we cannot kick. I love the media. I especially love CNN. I love me some Fox News. You you know that Tucker Carlson is on or Sean, I am all over. Like, you, you know, got Tucker Carlson in here. I would make out. No, that's gross. <laughs> Tucker Cuckerson. <laughs> Tuck you know, the it, cuck. Tuck the cuck. <laughs> Did you, there's been a, a, a thing uh, um, that was floating around about where he just totally called out the entire cause for striking Syria. You, you know what? Let's 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 give him props for that. He, he yeah. nailed the story. Tucker. I I'm a, I I actually was fairly impressed with that. That was actually one of the positive most positive things that I I'd, I'd seen in the media and it surprised me because it was coming from Fox News. But lately like there's there's been a lot of stuff in the media that's just been cringeworthy. I've just been seeing obnoxious stuff from both the the fake left like the democratic in the media and the right the first thing freaking washington post i guess not surprising considering washington post and where they are was calling for imperialism in syria because trump decided to de-escalate the war like a week ago you know, before he initiated strikes on Syria. But they were just calling for all-out imperialism because, fuck Trump, right? <laughs> right? If he's, if he's trying to de-escalate something, he's probably like Russians or something. I mean, it's bad for America, right? I don't, I don't need, like, I can't believe, looking back the two or three years ago, when, when, when I actually was a liberal, and this like, is how I liberals actually, think, though. Like, they, they literally think Trump bad always, even if he's... Uh, I mean, this does, like, him him giving some fake lip service about backing out only to have the, the, the state turn around, kick his ass, and tell him, no, you get your ass in there and you bomb, does not excuse all of the other shit that he's done. Like... No, it doesn't. It doesn't, but I, it's just... They have no consistent position here. Uh, Washington put like this article just shows that Washington. Well, they do. They're consistent position against Trump, and that's it. Whatever the consistent position is, whatever the bourgeois want, and it's just amazing how I used to think like there was good news and bad news, and that. I mean, already I didn't watch or listen to American news. I would only like read or listen to the BBC because <laughs> for some reason I thought, oh, that was better or more trustworthy because like they get outside the echo chamber of America. Like now it's, you know, even hard to listen to NPR because even NPR. They cheerleaded be... for the uh, war in Iraq the entire time. NPR can get away with calling bullshit on a lot of social domestic stuff, but no one is allowed to get away with calling bullshit on the war. Whatever war, whatever it is, whichever seamless war we've transitioned to on whatever part of the planet we're currently bombing. You, you've listened to NPR, so 
what do you know about NPR? I mean, really, you, you didn't notice, like, between every news segment? This broadcast is sponsored by Archer Daniel, Daniel Midland's Country and Exxon Mobil. So, so like, I've never heard an ad straight up for Exxon Mobil. M- most of the things are... PBS is funded by this grant from this rich person's foundation. So, I mean, it's obvious where, you know, money's coming from. Uh, the, the most I've seen pushback on would be, like, they're really, really local news or God help me when Prairie Home Companion would get political. Even even then, it, it still didn't leave the purview of the liberal idea of, well, we should tax more to move resources to... to alleviate this and n- nowhere was there an actual real solution you know I, I mean what are we gonna do all of our news is totally bought and sold by bourgeois interests or what's not is jimmy Dore, who for my own personal taste is way too much russia apologizing for me not to question like where shit's coming from there what do but... you mean too much russia apologizing i'm jimmy Dore. <laughs> God, he's annoying. Look, um, all I'm saying is, is give me a chance here to explain myself. Look, do I do I look like I take it up the butt from Putin? <laughs> no, I don't. And I find it absurd that I got sources here from the Intercept. Okay, the Intercept. <laughs> So, so you either have American bourgeois news or you have YouTube news, which all the funding is super sketch, or you have direct from the horse's mouth on Twitter and other social media, which then just fucking gets spiraled out of control and nothing's confirmed. So the, the entire idea of there being a followable narrative is just dead. Like, that's how we are even in the situation, like... I, I try to avoid YouTube news because I feel sexually harassed every time Phil DeFranco says, and you've been filled in. <laughs> Sorry. Whenever, when everyone's narrative becomes personal, there's no such thing as truth anymore. And that... I, I don't I don't have an answer to that, right? Like I find myself even as a communist still reading BBC who's able to read it through a lens and be able to say, oh, you know, you know they're running a, a, a shit piece on Xi Jinping this week because, you know, I know that there's a trade law about to drop. So, you know, we need to shit smear them. But what the hell are you gonna do? Where is the news coming? How do you find out stuff? What, the, the Trotskyist newspaper? Of course, the one that they're gonna drop thousands of dollars in, according to Drill. That was a, that was a fake one. <laughs> yeah, it was my favorite one, but it was fake as heck. <laughs> Aside from that, because because that that's just the example of the geopolitically level irresponsible. Uh, the the one thing that really did get my goat, actually, though, it was. Fox News, I think, took the award here for irresponsible journalism. Freaking publishing the fact that Nicholas Cruz, this freaking Stoneman Douglas high school shooting in Parkland, Florida, that guy, who's getting, like, fan mail and had women drooling over him and, and, and stuff. And I know this is, like, a thing with serial killers, but does this really need to go... On air? Does this need to be printed in the paper? Do people need to see this? Because if I was a lonely, isolated, depressed, unfucked, sad sack, which I am, but was also a Nazi, I'd be reading it that, oh man, if I go shoot up my high school, chicks are going to dig me and I'm going to be famous. Let's do that. That sounds like a good idea. Exactly. That was my point. Exactly. I was, when I saw the, that, I I about wanted to throw my computer just off the desk. I was just like, really? Why would you do that? Fox News, what's wrong with you? Well, I mean, you know, they have a vested interest in another school shooting happening because then they get to talk about evil Democrats who want to take away your guns. I would really hope that Fox News really isn't that evil. 
I, I understand that, like, I, I don't really have a high opinion of a lot of conservatives. But I would hope that they would know basic right from wrong. They demonize the kids. They literally perpetuate conspiracy theories about high okay. school kids who survived the shooting. I, I, I guess so. I, you, you, you have a point. It's just looking at this and, and looking at how could you run with this? Like, this is borderlining potentially... I, I could see lawsuits happening from this. Like, if somebody were to say, oh, so-and-so in the next school shooting was inspired because he read this article. And there's only a certain level of like freedom of press that you can, you you can go out towards by the way so they could literally be for for publishing this they could literally be sued for inciting violence really for that i mean i see why it's irresponsible i mean i get why it was a stupid decision to publish it but is it i mean i don't know i, th I feel like it's within the realm of stupid mistake and not for like saying oh yeah totally go shoot up your school because chicks are gonna dig you so you you think that it so in other words you do definitely think that it got past legal i think it probably was vetted by them well yeah like everything would have to be right i don't think they would publish anything without sending it through there now i i did think the last like story that i saw that just was absolutely irresponsible was the uh huffington post so let's get another left-wing uh, publication in here. Published a story on alt furry, absolutely just making them sound uh, humanizing and, and like great people. Well, it also made it sound like they were winning too. Like they're basically non-existent. Like I will give them props for like the reference to Lenin in the title. That's all that they get from me because the rest is bullshit. Yeah, I did notice that too. I thought that was pretty funny. It, it was just like they made it sound like they, you're right, that they were winning. Like, left, like it was literally the title was, like and we left us first fucking... wondering what to be done. Like, we yeah. we know what's to be done because we already did We've it. Done They're it. defeated. It's over. You're, exactly. you're done. <laughs> you're late. Exactly. Like, this article like would have been potentially okay ish maybe two years ago when we were dealing with good god what are these people how do we deal with this yeah but we came up with a strategy it worked things got really brutal for about a year and a half and things have pretty much died down these people pretty much aren't allowed at cons anymore so the thing so the specific thing about them is that they're not they are unable now to project force. They can sit in their little Nazi chat room and talk about the master is all they want. But they, they are not capable of organizing to project force and plan a swatting or an attack on a convention. Or even a personal one at this point. You know, they can't make a new Discord without it just getting, you know, destroyed the next day and have to make new Discord accounts. They just... It, it's their ability to organize they're just dismantled so they're still there they're still old buddies and they talk about how great it is to be white len still has his alt furry discord twitter that Hester's he uses to it. like shout into the void because no one's really listening anymore but they can't do anything pretty much they've been neutralized so the art the title of the article even though it's a reference to Lenin, it doesn't make any so sense like, it, it put it may it put us know, in a bad the, light. The, this article was published you know with no input from anyone who's been fighting alt furry and alt furry calls anyone who who doesn't like them leftist furs by the way like there are plenty of liberal furries who hate my commie guts who also like went to battle against alt furry. It's not Nazi furs versus leftist furs. It's shitty ass neo-Nazis versus everyone with a sense of public decency. They just call everybody <laughs> liberals. Yeah. Liberals are communists are anyone we don't like who's not us. Or they just become chickens and they go, oh, I ran cocks, cocks. Cock, 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 cock. I'm waiting for like an 
alt right fursona that's a chicken that just <laughs> screams cuck all the time. Like, cuck. Somebody could draw that for me and post it <laughs> so that we can we can retreat it. We will do that. So just that's your new fursona. At some no, it's not mine. <laughs> but I, I could just like see that like, and it's we, like drawn we, on like like in casters like crazy style too <laughs> let's ask Caster. yeah let's, let's we'll name that. it we'll name it we'll name it clucker cuckerson jeez there we go so uh if you guys want to do that just at one of us and we'll retweet it few last items though for today uh because i i did want to end on a positive note here we don't always we don't like to leave you on a downer positive. here positive 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 oh i got i got one better for you but we're going to keep it at the end of the show uh voters in alaska actually shot down an any transgender bill uh in one of the most conservative districts in the united states isn't Alaska somewhat weirdly in a liberal concept socialized? Don't, doesn't everyone from Alaska get like dividends? Of- yes, they do. So interestingly enough, the most con- one of the most conservative, socially conservative states in the United States is economically the most socialist state in the United States. But from a social conservative standpoint, though, that is that is very interesting that if they can't get this bill passed, it's probably not going to pass anywhere else. And everywhere that this has been done, it's always failed. So what this actually tells me, this gives me hope every time this comes up, it's going to easily fail. The only thing that would make one of, one of these bad boys pass is if liberals don't show up at the polls and do what liberals do, which is, I don't vote, man, because you can't change the system, man, from voting. No, if referendums, definite, if, I don't care if you don't agree with a politician or whatever, but get out of there and vote on those referendums. It, there's almost no point in voting for uh, representatives because they're just going to be bought by companies no matter what. But you want to vote for those few things that you can actually uh, have a say and You want to vote on referendums and you want to vote for school bond measures those few things that we're actually able to organize within our own community which are also the things that people don't even know about until after the fact that they see a local news broadcast and the people voted to you know, shot down the bond measure that would have allowed our kids to eat today oh i didn't know that happened if that happened i'd have voted there's almost no point in voting for representatives and a lot of people like they didn't vote and they didn't realize that they could have voted for that because they didn't go to the polls to see what was on the ballot because they just thought they were voting for the governor it's not like the state really encourages people to know anything period about their government you know what's interesting is i actually live in a state that's big on on this issue of voting we get a ballot in the mail a month before the actual election happens and we do the entire thing through mail ballot so arizona organizes its elections through the county recorder's office who decides what polling stations go where and how they're administered first time in 50 years there's a democrat in that office and he's at least a social democrat he's not a neoliberal so the mail ballot initiative has been widely expanded under him, but it's not quite as good as what you're describing. But yeah, still, you know, it, do people open that? It's just people, the, the state is organized to carry out the conflicting interests of conflicting bourgeoisie. It's not organized to do anything for common wage working people in their neighborhood. Uh, right, they make the it few- harder for working class people to vote, basically. Well, and, and what do they give us to vote on? The few times we're allowed to vote is mostly about schools, but then it's mostly about bond measures to keep things funded. It's not like people get to choose what's taught in their schools. That's not 
voted on at all. One of the only ways Arizona can get anything done is through a ballot initiative. And it's only there because it's protected in the state constitution because it was there as a prerequisite for statehood. We were not going to become a state unless we got the ballot initiative ability protected under the state constitution. So it's an untouchable thing. So the, the rare times things jump forward in the state when minimum wage is raised, pot will become legal in this state probably in 2018 it's all done every time through ballot initiatives but then there's also got to be a reason why you can't just put a ballot initiative that says it collectivize all private property and transition to socialism and have it pass and that's because they even rig the ballot initiative process by requiring certain amounts of signatures in certain places they actually tried one of the ways they tried to attack the ballot initiative recently was they wanted to make it so you needed the same number of signatures across all legislative districts which sounds okay until you think about like, well, okay, Arizona has a lot of desert in which like the <laughs> population is like two people per square mile. And if you need as many people, as many signatures of their signatures to get something on the ballot as you do from Maricopa County where Phoenix is, well, then it, it's kind of impossible. And that fell flat. But, you know, there's still a lot of ways that stuff is controlled and people's ability to choose is still really constricted to what's most often a, a non-choice. If it's roads that you're trying to fix, though, you could always just fix themselves instead of doing a ballot initiative. Which is exactly what anarchists did in Portland, Oregon. That's my home state, you guys. Uh, did you see this? Um, I know that they went and they filled in potholes. Exactly. Um, so that, that's pretty much just the gist of the story. Just these anarchists just went out and filled in potholes. It's, it's just that simple. It, it is kind of funny though, because like the article, uh, which I'll link to, they kind of spun it as like the city doesn't like it because it could be hazardous for vehicles or whatever. But I'd imagine that cold patching the roads is still safer than the potholes actually being in the road. I used to get almost bounced from my scooter every time I hit a specific pothole. And Arizona's roads are crap because not, not only does the state not believe in funding anything, but the desert sun just dries everything out. It's there are roads that are so bad. Like I've ended up driving on the wrong side of the road because you, 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 as the sun's setting, you can't tell the difference between the reflection of the lines of the lane and the, the bullshit band aid uh, tar paint that they put over the cracks. And so, so the in lane, other words, you're saying that you guys need a lot of anarchists. Yeah, we need a lot of anarchists in Phoenix, and they should all come here. Fix the roads. Come. <laughs> <laughs> the Tanner his road to games. <laughs> you know, well, you know, we're we're always complaining, like complaining on the internet. Well, instead of complaining on the internet, you go out and fix some roads. Maybe make some uniforms. You know, have a group that does it. Get to know the people in your community and everything. That's how you win people over. The, the who the people are gonna side with? They're gonna side with the people that helped them, not the people that evicted them from their homes. And that's, that's the thing that people need to understand. They're only going to side with authority if they see that that authority is legitimate. And the way that they determine that, that legitimacy is not necessarily through government, but through actually who was improving their lives. When it comes There's to the choice of, of, of choosing between the people that serve the community and the people that has always had the gun pointed at them, every time you know just waiting for them to screw up who are they gonna side with and i think that's that's the message so if we get out there and do stuff like patching holes in roads feeding the less privileged doing things like occupy medical whatever your specialty or your calling is to help other people if you go out there and do it then when time comes people will side with you and i think that's the big take here because if you look at it yeah, we had a lot of crap happen over the last two weeks. But this is also, since we've been doing the show, one of the better weeks here in terms of positive news. With the teachers, with the anarchists, with Zod. And they all have a common thread here. And these were all people that served their communities or defended their communities. And they won 
because they were integrated into those communities, because they had a stake in them. And that's the message here. I saw once like a year ago, before I was a communist, this Vietnamese grandma with a mohawk and she had her like NVA rifle battalion tattoo on her shoulder. And I keep hoping I'm going to see her again because I'm like, I just, how cool would that be? And it was just amazing that I saw this in my neighborhood. How cool would it be to like meet her and meet that person? And like, how did you do it? You're someone, I'm just a dipshit socialist on the internet who occasionally goes and volunteers at local farming projects and goes to a protest or two a week. You actually fought a war against imperialism. You actually, you know, lived it and, and did it. And, and what did you do? Not like the army stuff, not how many American imperialist pigs did you kill, but like as your country was coming together in the north and making this decision and reorganizing your community like how how did you do it and i keep hoping desperately i'm gonna run into this woman again in you know in the goodwill that i that i saw her in and like be able to connect like that because that is it is sad because it is a whole lost generation of socialists our generation doesn't have any kind of guidance all those states are gone or revisioned and what really should have been an obvious conclusion, like what they could have just told us in the beginning, everything that you just said we should do, we've had to figure out on our own. And I, that I is, think that, that we're, is the way forward. we're coming from a stronger point, though, than the right does. And that's a positive uh, because as, as much infighting as, as we've had on the left, we've also had a great sense of solidarity, even with as much as some individuals may want to refuse to work with people or dislike certain people, I think at the end of the day, our ability to come together and reconcile those differences between each other has been greater than those forces that keep people apart. Yeah, in this game, we're the only ones who aren't destructive. I mean, the alt-right's just outright purely destructive. A <laughs> force of destruction. In the liberals are destructive without quite being obviously destructive and at least maintain the status quo and then the social democracy the bench of the democratic party is still destructive in its own way because its answer is to take from someone to give to someone else and like it's not the main point of communism like they always push that oh communism is when you take from the rich and give to the poor and uh, it's about everyone working equally towards one goal I mean, yeah, there is like collectivizing private property and taking it from millionaires, but it's not in the form of, of taxing them a little bit more, which they're eventually going to find a way to fight back against. So, you know, liberalism is destructive in its own way. But we're the only ones who build anything, who build neighborhoods or fences or, or farms or gardens or networks of any kind. So while everyone else is just going to lose ground, we're the only ones who are going to gain it. So I think that's a positive note for us to, to leave you guys on, but I did want to leave you guys with one more joke because I did promise that I did have something better for you guys at the end of the episode here. So Attica, what yeah. is a wolf's favorite fruit? Gay foxes. No. An avocado. Oh my God. That's not even, I'm going to bed. Bye. <laughs> So, with the world in chaos from Enceladus Station, good night and good luck. Everything under heaven is in utter chaos, and the situation is perfect.